Uh, so in the last lecture, we were talking about uh, stuff that related to mutexes, looking at uh, the mutex type in the standard library, I believe, and also some RAII classes like uh, unique lock and share, or, I'm sorry, unique lock and uh, scope lock. And I just want to make a, another comment about uh, stuff relating to mutexes before we move on. There's a, a variadic function called lock, like variadic meaning it takes a number of param multiple parameters, and you can essentially give it a whole bunch of locks, an arbitrary number of locks, and it applies a, a deadlock avoidance algorithm to make sure that the locks are locked in a way that's sort of consistently ordered, for example. Um, so this is a similar sort of uh, functionality as what we saw with scope lock, where you can provide multiple locks, and then it will apply a deadlock avoidance algorithm when you construct the scope lock. Uh, so it's a similar sort of thing, but this is what you would apply maybe after the lock has been constructed and you want to uh, lock multiple mutexes. Uh, so there's a sh code example on this slide that illustrates how you could use this lock function. So this is the same example that we looked at a little bit earlier, um, but instead of using, uh, for example, using scope, I think we used scope lock before when we were acquiring multiple locks in the constructor. Here, what we've done is we've used unique lock and we've deferred the locking. So the constructors for unique lock are not going to acquire either mutex. And then because of this, we're forced to acquire both of them. We want to acquire both of them sort of at the same time using a single locking operation. So we can use the std lock function for this particular purpose. You probably wouldn't want to write this code in this way. It's really just for illustrative purposes because this is more complicated than just using a scope lock and grabbing both of the mutexes at the same time in the constructor. Uh, but this is just an illustration of how you can use that lock function. Any questions? Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is static initialization. Uh, if you have uh, like a local static variable, something or static local variable, something that looks like this, um, the, the particular point at which this gets constructed is the first time the execution passes through the statement that has the declaration in it. So for example, if you have this uh, a static local variable like this, um, the first time that we hit this line here, X will get initialized. And then subsequent times we hit that line, nothing happens. Um, a question that you might ask, though, is what happens if a, a multi-threaded application? So there's multiple threads that are running. Multiple threads might call this function. So maybe what happens if we have the situation arise where, you know, two threads actually call this function, you know, at the, for the very first time, sort of at the same time. Both of them hit this line at approximately the same time. Um, is there any guarantees made by the language that when the language initializes X that there's not going to be any data races or race conditions introduced by this? And in fact, the language guarantees that, that there won't be any bad things that happen. In other words, it will make sure that whichever thread, uh, if both threads come at the same time to this point where you're trying to initialize X, one of them will actually initialize it. The other one will wait until the first one is done. So you can't have any data races or things arising from code that looks like this. Anyway, just in case you might use some static local variables in your code. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is condition variables. We've talked about, uh, so far, the threads. We've talked about mutexes. And the other sort of essential element that we need to do useful things are condition variables. Um, where condition variables come into play is often when we're writing concurrent code, we have situations where maybe we have some threads that are doing some I.O., for example. Maybe a thread is reading some data from a network connection, for example. Um, and then because the processor is so much faster than the network connection, it's going to take some time before the data is actually available. So what we could do is we could just have the thread sitting there saying, is the data ready yet? Is the data ready yet? Asking the question billions of times, wait, waiting for the data to come in. Uh, this is not a very efficient way to do things, though, because we're, we're actually consuming the, one of the CPU cores to run code that basically does nothing. It's just keep yelling at, yell, yelling at the system, is the data ready, when of course it's not because the network connection is very slow. Um, so really what we'd like to do is we'd like to have situations, when situations like this arise where we have to wait for something, but it might be a fairly arbitrary length of time before that something happens. And for a network connection, for example, it could be quite, you know, quite a long period of time before the data is available compared to the speed of the processor. What we'd like to do is you'd like to have the thread block itself, put itself to sleep, and just not wake up and not do anything until the data is available. And this is the idea that's sort of uh, embodied by uh, condition variables. What condition variables allow us to do, they're a synchronization primitive that allows a thread to block waiting for a, a particular event to happen, for a particular condition to become true. Uh, and the basic idea is, for example, if that network connection situation I was describing, what you would do instead of spinning in a loop saying, like, is the data ready, is the data ready, is the data ready, what you would do is you check once, is it ready? If not, you'd block on a 
at least on a, waiting on a condition variable. And then when data does eventually become ready, the thing that notices that the data is ready would signal that condition variable, and then you would wake up at that point. Uh, so condition variables are really essential because we don't want to be doing a lot of uh, like busy waiting in loops, just checking to see if some condition is satisfied spinning in a loop. So the particular operations that are provided by a, a condition variable, there's, it provides a wait operation where you can basically wait for the particular condition that's associated with the condition variable to uh, become true, or more specifically, you wait for the condition variable to be signaled, someone basically indicating that the condition associated with the condition variable is true. And then the other operation that we have is what's called a signaling operation, which is essentially the way that we say that a particular condition is now uh, true, the one that's associated with the condition variable. Uh, so these are the two uh, key operations. Of course, we also have, you know, in, in, when we translate this into C++, there's also constructors and other things. But these are kind of the two essential operations that are associated with condition variables, weight and signal. Um, when a, a thread wakes up after it's been signaled, so like a thread, for example, does a weight operation. It's waiting for the condition variable to be signaled. Then eventually someone notices that the condition that's associated with the condition variable is now true, so it signals the, the condition variable. And then the thread that was blocked waiting, it now wakes up. Um, when the thread wakes up, however, there's no uh, guarantee that the condition will be true by the time the thread actually starts running and, and doing stuff. Because from the time that the thread that signaled the condition variable, from the point in time from when that occurs to the time where the thread that actually wakes up and does something, the one that was waiting wakes up, acquires a mutex and actually starts doing something, another thread could have come in and changed the underlying state of the data that's associated with the condition variable such that the condition that you are trying to represent by that condition variable is no longer true. So whenever you wake up from a wait operation, the first thing you always want to do is recheck the condition to see if it's still true. If it's not, then you just go back to sleep, you wait again on the condition variable. And the other reason that this can happen as well, the reason that you could wake up from a wait operation and the condition that was signaled to you is not true, is that also a lot of implementations of condition variables allow what's called spurious awakenings, which is essentially no one signaled the condition variable, but the operating system can just say, hey, I feel like waking you up. I'm just going to wake you up for fun. These are what are called sp spurious awakenings. In other words, there's just kind of randomly, you randomly wake up at, at various points in time. So for these two reasons, you always have to recheck the condition when you wake up just to make sure that it's still true. So the manner in which this particular concept gets translated into a C++ standard library is the uh, std condition variable class. So this is the thing that represents uh, or implements a condition variable in the standard library. Um, this particular type is not movable and not copyable. So you have to kind of keep that in mind. You can't do anything that would require moving or copying these types around. The Wait operation, there's three flavors of the wait operation that are provided. There's a member function called wait, one called wait for, and one called wait until. Uh, wait is just your plain basic like block until the condition variable gets signaled. So it will block indefinitely. If the condition variable never gets signaled, you just don't wake up. And then wait for and wait until are blocking versions of wait, but they have a timeout. And the only difference between wait for and wait until is the way in which the timeout is specified. But basically, you block waiting for the condition on the for the condition variable to be signaled, but if the timeout elapses before any, anyone notifies that uh, condition variable, in other words, anyone signals it, you'll wake up and it will just return saying that you woke up because the timeout expired. And then the uh, signaling operation for condition variables is implemented or available through the notify one and notify all functions for the condition variable class. Uh, the difference between them, they both signal threads saying that the condition that's associated with the condition variable is now true. Um, the difference between them, notify one will only notify one of the threads. It will signal one of the threads that's blocked on the condition variable. Because you might have a whole not, whole bunch of them that are all blocked on the condition variable. It will only wake up one of them. Whereas notify all will, will wake up all of the threads if there's multiple ones that are blocked on the condition variable. And which one you would call depend on what, what effect you want. In some cases for the algorithm you're implementing, you'd want all of them to be notified. Other cases, maybe only one. And as I mentioned on the previous slide, whenever you wake up from a, a wait operation, you always have to make sure that the condition that's associated with the condition variable uh, is still true. And there's two reasons why you need to do this checking. Uh, one of them is the most fundamental one, which is that um, between the time the thread is signaled and the time it wakes up and actually starts doing stuff, another thread could have come along and changed the state of the, you know, the variable that's associated with the condition variable such that the condition is no longer true. Um, 
Uh, also, on some operating systems, as I mentioned before, you can have spurious awakenings, which is essentially the operating system is free to just wake you up whenever it feels like, uh, even though the condition variable might not ever have been signaled in the first place. And this just allows for more efficient implementation of condition variables. There's some systems on which if spurious awakenings weren't permitted, then the performance is like you take a big performance hit in terms of making sure condition variables work correctly. So instead, they just say, let spurious awakenings happen. And then this allows these systems to implement condition variables much more efficiently. And it's not a big deal because, because of the second issue, you always have to recheck the condition anyway. So this is just the spurious awakenings just don't really cause any big practical problems. They don't really change your code in any fundamental way. Um, in terms of these functions, notify one, notify all, wait, wait for, wait until, all these allow for concurrent invocation. So you don't have to worry about, oh my gosh, what happens if two threads call notify one at the same time or something like that. This is all you know, safe to do. It's kind of internally these different functions are you know, protected from being invoked from multiple threads at the same time. They won't, won't introduce any data races or other things like that. Um, the functions wait, wait for, and wait until, the various different variants of wait, the wait operation, uh, these things have the behavior that they atomically release the mutex that's being held and then blocks. Uh, Any time that you wait, you're always, you must be holding a mutex at the time that you wait. And the basic idea is the wait function, one of the, the parameters it takes is the mutex that you're using. And what it will do is when you, when you wait, it will atomically release the mutex that you're holding and also block waiting on the condition variable. And the reason why these operations have to be atomic, I can explain this maybe in terms of a picture here. So the wait operation, again, whenever you, whenever you do a wait, you must be holding a mutex at the time that you wait because you have to provide a mutex that you're currently holding to the wait function. Um, and basically, the, the mutex is going to be associated with whatever data relates to the condition variable, right? Essentially, the condition variable is signaling something in the data that you're sharing between threads has changed, and because of this, you might be interested and you want to wake a thread up. Um, but that data because it's being shared by multiple threads, it has to be protected by a mutex. Otherwise, different threads could come in, access it at the same time, and you have a data race. So this is the reason why when you when you go into a wait, you're already holding a mutex, because if you weren't, there'd be issues with respect to the data that you're, the shared data that's being manipulated by the different threads that the condition variable relates to. Anyway, so the wait, the wait operation atomically releases the mutex as being held in blocks on the condition variable. And this is, again, this is atomic. The reason for this atomicity is if it wasn't atomic, this, the, these two steps here, releasing the mutex and blocking waiting on the condition variable, you could have situations arise where another thread comes in, it changes the state of the, the data in, in a way that requires this condition variable to be signaled. It signals the condition variable. And because this, the original thread wasn't yet blocking waiting for that signal, it never sees it. Because when you block waiting on a, sig uh, a signal to a condition variable, you only see things that happen after you block. Anything that happened in the past, it's too late, you missed it. So this is the reason for this sort of uh, behavior here. Any questions? And then lastly, notify one and notify all are also atomic operations. So that's the condition variable class. If we look at the various different members of the condition variable class in a little bit more detail, there's some there's a member type called native handle type, which plays a similar role as in some of the other types we looked at. It essentially gives you a, a hook into the kind of internal implementation of the condition variable. Effectively, underneath, inside the condition variable implementation will be some operating specific condition variable type. And essentially, this gives you a way to kind of get access to it. This is the, the it gives you a handle to that particular underlying thing. Um, but we're not going to use the native handle types in this course, but just so that you know what they are. They, they would be for more advanced usage where you want to kind of take advantage of the fact that in a particular operating system, you know the underlying thing that's being used to represent a condition variable, and you maybe want to take advantage of some additional features it provides that are not available through the C++ API, like the API for the condition variable class. Uh, of course, you have constructors and destructors. Without them, we can't really do too much with this type. Um, as I mentioned before, the type's not movable or copyable, so the operator, assignment operator is deleted also. There's no mover copy constructor. Uh, then maybe the more interesting functions we have, uh, again, notify one and notify all. These are used for performing signaling operations for signaling a condition variable. The only difference between them is notify one only signals one thread. Like it will wake up one thread that's waiting if there's more than one, whereas signal all will wake up all the threads that are currently blocked on the condition variable. 
And then for weight, we have three variants of weight. The very first one, as I mentioned before, essentially this is a non or a blocking weight. It will block forever, trying to, you know, waiting for the condition variable to be signaled. Whereas wait for and wait until have a timeout. So they block, but if the timeout expires, then you'll wake up and it will just say that it that no signaling of the condition variable happened, essentially. Like it will tell you that it, you woke up because the timeout expired. And then there's a function to get you the actual native handle. Again, this would be used in situations where you want to maybe do some more op operating specific operating system specific stuff and actually use the underlying uh, condition variable type that's used to implement the condition variable um, or condition variable class. And then I have an example here to illustrate how we can use condition variables. So the first example I want to go through is uh, an integer stack. So we have essentially an unbounded stack. There's no limit to how many elements that we can push onto the stack in this particular code. And we have a very basic interface, like we can construct an integer stack with a default constructor, it just creates an empty stack. Um, we can't move it or copy it. We've essentially deleted these operations just to make the example uh, much simpler. And we can uh, we pop and push elements for the stack. So if we look at the pop, or actually maybe I should look at the data members down below here. So essentially what we have is a vector which is going to hold the elements that we're pushing onto the stack. And it's an integer stack, so the elements are ints. So we have a vector of ints. And because this is going to be shared potentially between multiple threads, we have to have some kind of mutex to protect this data. Otherwise, we could have data races if multiple threads are trying to access this, uh, this vector at the same time. Um, or we could have other race conditions corrupt the data structure and so on. So we have a mutex for this purpose, which is called M. And we also have a condition variable as well, because what we want to do is when we, when we pop something from the stack, if the stack is empty, rather than spinning in a loop saying, is there something on the stack? Is there something on the stack? Is there something on the stack? We just want to put the thread to sleep. And then at some later point when something becomes available due to pushing something onto the stack, what will happen is the thread that pushes something onto the stack will then signal the condition variable, which is basically representing the fact that now the, 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 uh, the, the stack is not empty anymore. So essentially the condition that this uh, condition variable is associated with or what it's trying to represent is the notion that the stack is not empty. So anytime the stack becomes not empty, we can signal this variable to indicate this. Uh, then, and, and basically both of these are mutable for reasons that I talked about in earlier examples, because if we don't make these two things mutable, then if there were any const member functions for this class, or we have like, well, there, there, I don't think there are any const members here, but if there were any, this would cause problems because const member functions can't perform operations that mutate the state of the underlying mutex or condition variable. And all the useful things that you'd want to do with these, these uh, types of objects, mutex and condition variables are things that mutate the state of them. Um, so we don't really want them to be considered part of the state of the stack. So effectively what mutable is saying is that when you're considering the constness of these int stack objects, these things are not considered. You can change them anytime. It doesn't matter if the object is const or not. And, and the only reasonable use cases for the mutable keyword in this course would be for mutexes and condition variables. I can't think of any other legitimate use case uh, for it other, other than just you don't know how to use const correctly and you're making everything mutable so things still work. Anyway, so with that said, let's actually go back and look at what the kind of more interesting functions in this code are doing. So we have a pop function, which essentially pops the top element off the stack and returns it. It's a stack of ints, so it's going to return an int. And then we have a push function, which takes an int to push onto the stack. So if we look at the pop function, first of all, uh, the very first thing we do inside the pop function is we acquire our mutex m. So we're going to use a unique lock to do this because we want to not just directly do mutex operations, uh, just, you know, for example, in case an exception is thrown or whatever, just to protect against the fact that we, for some reason, forget to release the mutex in the end. So we use an RAI type, like unique lock. So after this constructor returns, we'll have acquired the mutex M. So that means that it's safe for us to start, for example, modifying the shared state, like the, the uh, vector V, which could be accessed potentially by multiple threads, because multiple threads could be using the same int stack at the same time. Uh, so we know we're the only only uh, thread that's going to be doing this since we have acquired the mutex. And then what we want to do is we want to, instead of spinning a loop saying, is there something on the stack? Is there something on the stack? And then finally, when there is, we, we pop it off and return it. Instead, what we want to do is we want to say, is there something on the stack? If not, block. So the way that we achieve this is we use the weight operation on our condition variable. And essentially, the first parameter here is the mu a mutex which we currently hold. You must be holding the mutex. And it's the mutex that's associated with the data which is associated with the condition variable. So this condition variable is essentially associated with basically the, the, the vector v. 
Um, so it's, it's somehow capturing something about what state the vector v is in. In this particular case, it's representing whether the vector v is empty or not, essentially, or the condition of, of the, the vector becoming non-empty. Uh, so what we're going to do it for the second argument here, what we're specifying is a, basically a callable entity, like a functor or a function, something that can be invoked, which will essentially return true when the condition that you, you're waiting for is true. So what we want to wait for is we want to wait for this, the stack being not empty. So essentially what we're doing is we're waiting until the stack is not empty by using this, uh, the empty member of the vector class. Vector class has a member called empty, which just returns true or false to say whether the vector is empty. So we return if the vector is not empty, meaning that there is actually something in the, the stack. And then at this point, we, we will have reacquired the mutex. So like when you wait, it releases the mutex and, and blocks you waiting on the condition variable. This happens atomically. But when you come out of the wait, when finally you wake up, it also reacquires the mutex for you. So we have the mutex again here. So we're, we're still safe. We can access, for example, the vector. We don't have to worry about other threads doing this at the same time and causing data races or other kind of race conditions. Uh, so then what we do is we just read the last element on, on the, in our vector using the back member function for vector. Uh, then we pop that element off the stack so it's gone, and then we return the value that we read. Any questions with this function? Yeah? You mentioned that you want to recheck your condition when you wake up. Is that just inherent to the wait function? Okay, so maybe I should comment about this. So there's there's multiple, like, wait is overloaded, so there's multiple overloads of it. The particular one that we're using, it obviously it takes two arguments. We're passing two things to it. The second thing is essentially a condition that we want to, is a condition that we're waiting for. And this is effectively the same as calling, it's basically a while loop where it's saying, while this is not true, like, while this condition is not true, we wait. But effectively, there's a kind of loop that's baked into this particular way that we're invoking wait. Does that make sense? Okay. Any other questions about this function before we go on to push? Okay, well then let's look at the push function. So in the push function, again, we're giving it an int x, which is the integer that we want to push onto the stack. So the very first thing we're doing is we're acquiring our mutex just to make sure that the shared data, the vector that we're using underneath is not going to get you know, trampled on by two threads at the same time or introduce any data races and so on. Uh, so once we've returned from the constructor here, we're guaranteed that we've acquired the mutex. So we know that we're safe to start accessing the, the vector V. We're not going to have any data races or other kind of race conditions. And then we push back the particular element that we're given, basically stick it onto the end of the vector. And then what we want to do at this point is we want to invoke notify, to do a signaling operation, because there may be another thread which is blocked waiting to do a pop, but there's no data to pop. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to signal now, and again, the condition variable is representing the event that the, the stack is not empty. Uh, so just in case it was empty before, we're going to invoke notify1 to say, hey, everyone, essentially the stack now has data on it. We don't call notify all, though, because we only just put one single element onto the stack. So if there were like 25 different threads that are all blocked waiting to pop something off the stack, and then we put one element on, I mean, we could call notify all, and then all 25 threads wake up, one of them grabs the data and then all 24 go back to sleep. But that would be kind of silly. Instead, we just signal one because it would be kind of pointless to wake everybody up because we know that only one of them is going to be able to get the data anyway. So instead, we do notify one. I guess in principle, you could do notify all. It'll still work. It's just going to be much less efficient. You're potentially waking up many threads, and then they immediately all go back to sleep except for one of them. And then when we return, of course, this is going to scope lock reaches the end of its lifetime and then the, the mutex gets released, just like what we had up above here. When we reach the end of the brace bracket for pop, this unique lock goes out of scope and then the mutex is released. And by the way, I believe you can also, you can actually do the signaling operation outside of the lock. It's not required. And actually, I believe it's more efficient to do it outside of the lock, uh, but it, it won't hurt anything doing it inside be the reason why you might want to do this signaling outside of holding the lock is effectively what it depends on how things are implemented in the operating system at least as I understand it but but the issue is that if you if you do the notify while you're holding the mutex as soon as you notify if someone was waiting they're gonna wake up right away but what's the first thing they're gonna do they're gonna try try to acquire the mutex that you're holding well you hold it so they're gonna go back to sleep so essentially by signaling while you're holding the lock you're Again, it depends on how things are implemented, but for some operating systems, what might happen is that you wake the other thread up as soon as they get the notify, but then they're going to be put back to sleep because you still haven't released the mutex that they're going to acquire, because you know the one they're going to acquire is the one that you're holding, and you haven't released it yet. Um, so this is the reason why, at least on some systems, it's a little bit more efficient to um, 
do the signaling outside of holding the lock. Yeah? If you had another uh, uh, member function in there, which also had a weight on the condition variable, um, but on a, but it was like a different lambda in there, a different condition, mm -hmm. and, and still in push, you have the same thing in push. Uh, it's, how would C notify one behave in that case? Like, what is it notifying? Like what condition is it notifying that? But like the condition variable itself doesn't have any notion of what the condition is that you're signaling. Like basically what it is, is it's just, it's something that you can signal and say, hey, whatever event you represent, it's, it's happened. And, and you know, please wake up some, one or more threads. One if it's notify one, or all of them if it's notify all. But the condition variable itself has no idea what it represents in terms of conditions. So um, probably you would want to use it in a consistent way. Like for example, in this particular case, we're using the condition variable to represent the notion that the, the stack is not empty. But there's nothing to prevent you from maybe using a completely different condition somewhere in the code and signaling that different condition with this condition variable. It probably logically wouldn't make sense. Like it probably would be a bug, but the condition variable can't like flag it as an error because it has no idea what it's representing. It's just something that, it's just a, a very kind of dumb data type in some sense. You can you can say, do signaling operations which says, you know, wake up either one thread that's blocked waiting on you, or you can do, notify all, wake up all of them. And you can also um, block waiting for the condition, but it doesn't really know the condition itself, what it represents. So if I was understanding your question correctly, like there's nothing stopping you from doing like, like wait operations where maybe the condition variable that you're waiting on, you're giving it a, condition that doesn't really make sense given what the condition variable is representing and there's not really any way the condition variable can know that something is wrong. So if you were to do that then and have a different, like a totally different lambda just as an experiment, um, then the notify one would kind of notify both of them, like they would both be treated the same way. Uh, so if you did have one thing that was waiting on one condition, one thing waiting on another condition, notify one could notify either of those and they would be treated the same way. Right. So, so, no, so basically what notify one does, you have zero or more threads that are blocked waiting on that condition variable. Zero because maybe nobody's waiting, but, but in the case that you're talking about that's more interesting, at least one is waiting. And what all notify one does is it just takes one of those threads that's waiting and lets it run, unblocks it. Um, so it, it doesn't really matter what the condition was that was provided for the wait. It's simply, again, the condition variable is kind of stupid. Like it doesn't have any notion of like it doesn't have the notion, for example, that it re in this particular case, it represents the stack being not empty. It has no idea. All it is, it, it just, it, it understands it represents some event. And when you signal it, you're saying this event has occurred, but it has no idea what it is. Any other questions? Now, the next example that I want to consider is one that's using latches, what's called a latch. So we're gonna implement a latch using condition variables to help us. So latch is just a, a basic one-time synchronization mechanism. And what it allows you to do is it allows threads to block until, until a particular event happens a certain number of times. And essentially the state that's associated with the latch is just a count. And when you create the latch, you initialize the count to some non-zero value, which is essentially the count of how many times do you want that event to happen. Um, like. The, whatever event that you're interested in, you're interested in some number of times that that event happens. And the count that you initialize the latch to would be that count, like the number of times that you're interested in that event happening. And then there's some very basic operations that are provided by latch. You can decrement the count. So the basic idea is whenever an event occurs, which is the particular type of event that you're sort of counting with this latch, you would call the operation or invoke the operation that decrements the count. And the other thing that you can do with a latch is you can say block until the count goes to zero. So the basic idea is if you want to sit, you want to maybe have threads block until some event happens n times, you would create a latch with a count of n, and then each time the event happens, the thread that notices that it happens decrements the count, and then when the thread reaches the point where it wants to make sure it doesn't proceed until at least n, until these n events have happened, it would call the function which blocks until the count reaches zero. And if it starts out as n, it gets decremented each time the event happens. The time when it reaches zero means now you've seen n events happen. And then at this point, presumably you want threads to wake up and do something. Uh, latches can only be used once. This is what's meant by the fact it's a one-time synchronization mechanism. So what I mean by this is that once the count goes down to zero, there's no way to reset the count back to whatever it was originally or to change it to some non-zero value. Once the latch count runs out, you're done with the latch. You can't reuse it. It's just garbage at that point. It's not helpful anymore. 
And this just allows the lags to have a kind of simpler implementation, the fact that you can't, can't sort of recycle it and reuse it. Any questions about what a latch is? Uh, so to give an example of how you might actually use a latch in some code, suppose that we, well, in this particular code here, what we have in the main function, we have some code that's going to fire up 32 threads, and all of these threads are going to be executing um, this thread function here. They're all going to be running this function worker. So what the threads are all going to be doing, they perform some kind of initialization. What it is, it's not important, but it's represented by the dot, dot, dot here. And then there's some real work that the threads do. And the basic idea here is that we're gonna be starting up 32 different threads. And we, for whatever reason, because of the thing that we're doing in the initialization here and the thing that we're doing in this real work that's being performed after things are initialized, for some reason, it's really important that we not let any of the threads proceed to performing the real work until all of the threads are initialized. So how can we make sure that this happens? This is a good use case for a latch. What we can do is in the main function here, we've created a latch uh, variable called ready. And we've initialized its initial count to num the number of worker threads that we're going to create. So this would be 32. So essentially, the, if we block waiting for the, the count for the, the latch to go to zero, we're going to have to decrement it 32 times before we would be allowed to proceed. Uh, if, so if we look at how this is actually being used up above here, the basic idea is each uh, worker thread, what it's going to do, it performs its initialization. And then once it's done its initialization, it then counts down it decrements the, the count that's associated with this uh, latch and then waits. So this is like a combination of decrementing the count and then waiting until the count goes to zero. And because we initialize this count to be 32, the count that's associated with the latch, and the only place that we're decrementing it is when a thread for the very first time finishes its initialization. The only time that a thread would be able to get past this function, in other words, this function will return, is all 32 threads have called this function, the count has been decremented all the way down to zero, meaning that all of the threads have actually finished their initialization and actually called this function. Uh, so then at this point, we're safe to proceed and perform this other work. Any questions? This is just an example of a use case where you might use a latch. So if you look at the actual code for the latch, so we have a, a simple implementation of a latch. Uh, we have a number of different uh, member functions. We have a constructor. And again, the constructor, we need to provide a count. This is the initial count for the latch. Essentially, the main state associated with the latch, ignoring like mutexes and condition variables, the basic state is the count. Um, so we initialize the count to whatever value is passed in the constructor. And then we have a few different member functions, countdown, wait, try, wait, and countdown and wait. So if I just go through each of these in order, so countdown is the operation which is going to decrement the count that's associated with the uh, with the latch. So again, the very first thing that we're going to do is we're going to acquire our mutex, the one down here that we're using to protect the data that's associated with this latch. I mean, primarily we're protecting count here. We want to make sure that two threads don't come in and start messing with the count at the same time. So we acquire our lock. Um, after the constructor returns, we're guaranteed that we're the you know we have mutual exclusion. No other. Uh, threads are in any of these member functions trying to do stuff with that count variable, count data member. And then what we do while we're holding this uh, mutex, we decrement the count and then check to see whether the decremented count is zero. I remember that the value of the expression when you use prefix decrement, this is having the value after you've decremented. So effectively, we're decrementing the count and then checking to see if that decremented count is zero, meaning effectively the count has gone to zero. If the count has gone to zero, then we notify all the threads that are waiting on this condition variable. We have this condition variable ready, and maybe I should have commented about this initially. This ready condition variable is representing the notion that the count has gone all the way down to zero. It's reached zero. And then we basically want to wake everyone up at that point. So ready is representing the fact that the count has reached zero. Uh, so in this particular case, if the count goes to zero, then we signal all the threads that are blocked waiting on this condition variable, telling them, hey, everyone, the count has gone to zero. Uh, and then, of course, when we reach the end of this function here, this scope lock goes out of scope, and then the, the mutex gets released when we destroy that uh, scope lock object. Uh, then if we go on to the mate, main, sorry, wait function, again, the behavior of wait is it waits, it will block the thread until the count eventually goes down to zero for, for the latch. So again, just like with the other uh, member function, the very first thing we want to do is acquire the mutex so that we're ensuring that no two threads are coming in and accessing the underlying shared data, the, the count underscore data member at the same time, for example. And then once we have the mutex, then we uh, perform a wait operation uh, where we're waiting on this, this ready condition variable, the one that's signaling the condition that the uh, count has reached zero. 
And the condition that we're waiting for is we're saying we're going to keep basically waiting until the count zero. So effectively, what this will do is it's as if it's calling wait in a loop. It will say, is this condition not true? In other words, you know, the, the count isn't zero, and it will keep looping on, as long as the count isn't zero. And when the count eventually becomes zero, then we'll come out of this function and return. And at this point, then the function will be allowed to proceed on. The, the, the caller of this function will be allowed to proceed on because the thread will become unblocked. And when we return here, of course, because this unique lock is reaching the end of the scope here, as the very last thing before we return from wait, we're going to release the mutex that we're holding. Any questions so far? Okay, if, uh, try wait is just a non-blocking uh, version of wait. It allows us to check to see what would we actually wait if we actually invoked wait. Uh, so again, we acquire our mutex to make sure that there's no data races and so on, or race conditions involving this, this shared variable count, which is possibly shared by a number of threads calling different members of this latch class. Um, and then what we're doing is we're just checking to see if the count is zero, returning if the count is zero as a Boolean value. And of course, when we when we hit the closing brace bracket here, the lock scope lock reaches the end of its lifetime, and it gets destroyed, releasing the mutex. So you can see here by using scope lock, this is very advantageous because we, we can't accidentally forget to release the mutex. The worst that we can do is we release it maybe at the wrong place, but at least we can't forget. Uh, then if we look at the very last member function here, countdown and wait, this is basically just kind of a combination of the functionality of countdown and wait but effectively kind of combined together and all sort of done uh, without any intervening operations happening. So we acquire a lock to begin with, the mutex that uh, protects the data, the count variable, and then we're going to decrement the count and then check to see if the decremented count is zero. If it is, then we notify all the threads that are blocked on this condition variable. Uh, otherwise, if this is not true, then we're going to wait because it's countdown and wait. Uh, and we wait on the condition that the the condition we're waiting for it to be true is that the count is equal to zero. And again, whenever wait, whenever wait returns, you always have the mutex locked again. So when we return from wait, we have the mutex locked, and when we eventually fall off the end of this function here, when we hit the closing brace bracket, the unique lock object reaches the end of its lifetime and the mutex gets released. Any questions about any of that example? Earlier, we were introduced to the condition underscore variable class in the standard library. As it turns out, this particular class has the limitation that when you're performing a weight operation, the type of the lock that's provided to the weight operation has to have the type unique lock instantiated on std mutex. Uh, so if you want to use some other lock type, you can't use the condition variable class in the standard library. There is, however, another implementation of condition variables called condition variable any that's provided by the standard library. And this particular class allows any mutex type to be used, provided that it meets certain basic requirements in terms of the interface that it provides. And the interface for uh, condition variable any is very similar to the interface for condition variable, so I'm not going to go into any detail about the, the interface of the condition variable any class. Uh, one comment I should make with respect to these uh, two classes is that you should prefer to use the condition variable class rather than condition variable any in cases where this is possible because there may be some efficiency gains that can be made by using condition variable rather than condition variable any. In other words, the extra generality that's provided by condition variable any may incur some additional cost in terms of efficiency. So for this reason, we would prefer to use condition variable rather than condition variable any in cases where this is feasible. And I think this is the last topic I need to talk about with respect to concurrency. Uh, and this relates to part of the assignment that you need to do for the concurrency assignment. Essentially, part of what you're going to be doing is implementing what's called a thread pool. Uh, so what a thread pool is, it's just a, as the slide says here, it's just a collection of threads that are basically waiting to perform some work. And essentially, the issue that a thread pool is trying to address is that when you're trying to create a thread, there's overhead associated with doing it. Typically, you'll have to call out to the operating system, say, please create a thread for me, and this is not necessarily a cheap operation to do. Also, when the thread finishes doing whatever it's doing, you need to destroy the thread. And, and again, typically, you need to call out to the operating system to do this. It's not necessarily a very cheap operation. So if you imagine a situation where 
maybe you want to use threads, so you have a multi-core processor, there's some tasks that you want to use many different threads to do the processing, because you maybe have maybe 16 different cores and you want to at least have 16 threads running to perform the processing you're doing, so you can kind of fully utilize the core. And suppose that the tasks that you're performing, you have like many, many, many small tasks. They don't take very long to execute at all. Uh, so you have a large number of tasks that complete very quickly. But you still want to use like a multi-threaded kind of uh, uh, strategy to handle things because you want to fully utilize all the cores on the system that you're using. In such a situation, it would be a bad idea to say, well, every time I want to process a new task, one of these things that take a very long, a very short period of time to process, I'll create a thread, do the small little processing, and then kill the thread, like destroy it. Because percentage-wise, the amount of time you're going to be spending doing useful work, the actual processing, will be very small compared to the time it takes to create the thread before you do the processing and then destroy the thread when you're done. Again, it's important here, we're saying, suppose that the tasks that are being performed by the thread are very short. They don't require a lot of computation time. So percentage-wise, the overhead for creating a thread and destroying a thread dominates. Maybe you spend 99.9% .9 of your time just creating and destroying threads, and then 0.1% of the time, whatever's left over, actually doing useful work. Uh, so what thread pools try to address is they say, in situations like this, a better strategy is, let's, if we say we want to use 16 different threads, let's create 16 threads and just have them sitting there. They're not doing anything to initially. And then as tasks come along, we'll assign threads to those tasks to perform them. And then when they're done, rather than killing them, like destroying them, we just put them back into idle state. They go dormant, they block, and they wait until we have a new task to give to them. So essentially, this is what a thread pool is. And essentially what this allows us to do, again, is in situations where the amount of processing that's required by the task that we're performing is relatively small, it allows us to not keep incurring the cost of creating a thread, destroying a thread, creating a thread, destroying a thread. Instead, at the very beginning when we create the thread pool, for example, we create a whole bunch of threads and just have them sitting there, they're blocked, not doing anything. Then as we assign tasks to them, or as we get tasks to for the thread pool to do, we assign the tasks to them. When, they, when they're done, though, we don't destroy them. We just put them back into an idle state. And then the only time we would destroy the threads is when everything is done, we destroy the thread pool object. We would invoke the, you know, the destroy operation to destroy those, those thread objects. So effectively, we only create those threads once at the beginning when we create the thread pool, and then we destroy them once at the end. So we avoid all this huge amount of overhead of creating, destroying, creating, destroying threads. So this is the basic idea behind a thread pool. Any questions? So just to give an idea of the, the type of interface that might be provided by a thread pool, I mean, obviously I'm not going to go through an implementation because I just mentioned you're going to be implementing this in the assignment, so I'm not going to give you the answer. Uh, but I'll show you sort of what a typical interface might look like. And I think this is fairly similar to what's in the specification for the assignment. It might not be identical, but it, at least it's very close if it isn't identical. Um, so suppose that we have uh, well, maybe I'll look at the thread pool class to begin with. Um, so we have a constructor which can create a thread pool, and we specify how many threads do we want to be in the pool. And the particular behavior for this thread pool is the number of threads is static. Like, you can't kind of adjust it on the fly. Some thread pools are more fancy. It's not entirely true. Maybe all the threads are created at the beginning, and then they're only destroyed at the end. Maybe you can dynamically add, add more threads to the thread pool. But here we're just talking about a much simpler interface. So in the constructor, we're specifying how many threads do we want. Those will be... Uh, when the object, the thread, thread pool is constructed, it will create those many threads and just leave them in an idle state. And this is why we need to specify the number of threads for the constructor. Um, then we've deleted a bunch of member functions, which are not very interesting. We have a destructor. Um, we have a ability to query how many threads there are in the thread pool. So this is just a, a simple a const member function because it doesn't really change any of the state. It's just saying how many threads there are that we can run things on. Um, the more interesting functions are the last two here. We have a function called schedule where we can give it some kind of callable entity, which is represented by std function. std function is just a wrapper. It can basically like encapsulate any kind of callable entity, like a, a functor or a function, for example. Um, so we have a function which basically takes no parameters and returns void. This is the type of function that we take. Anything that's compatible with that, it takes no arguments and returns void, we can represent by this type. Um, we're using an R value reference here. So what this is implying is that when we give this object to schedule, it's free to rip the guts out of this thing and use, mutilate its value however it sees, sees fit. Um, and the basic idea here, what this is going to do is it's going to make whatever function is, this, or like the callable entity that's associated with this std function, it's going to assign it to one of the threads to run at some later point in time. And then what shutdown does, it just waits for all the threads to finish the work that they're doing. Typically you would call shutdown before you completely dismantle the thread pool. And 
yeah, maybe, maybe I better stop here for today because I'm kind of running out of time. I'll finish uh, looking at the mean function down below here in the next lecture. Any questions?